Let's get weird into it. Number 9. The Planet's Awkward Phase You probably think of the Earth's magnetic field as a kind of nerdy, invisible superhero. It's always there, dutifully fending off solar radiation with a force field straight out of a B-movie. And it helpfully points your compass north so you don't get lost on your way to get artisanal cheese. But what if that superhero decided to go on a very long, very confusing bender? That's a geomagnetic reversal. And it's not a question of if it will happen, but when. See, the Earth's core isn't a solid, stable thing. It's a churning, sloshing hellscape of molten iron, acting like a giant electrical generator, or dynamo. This is what gives us our cozy magnetic shield. But sometimes this dynamo gets a bit wobbly. The North Pole starts wandering off towards Siberia, and the South Pole might decide to take a vacation near Brazil. This has happened hundreds of times in our planet's history. For a while, during the reversal process, which can take thousands of years, things get weird. The main magnetic field weakens, maybe down to 10% of its current strength. It doesn't just vanish, it fractures. You might have multiple North and South Poles popping up all over the globe, like a planetary game of whack-a-mole. Your compass would be useless, spinning like a confused party guest. This is bad news for migrating birds, sea turtles, and whales, who use the magnetic field as their own private GPS. They'd suddenly be flying into skyscrapers or beaching themselves, their internal navigation system screaming error messages they can't understand. But it's even worse news for you. That weakened shield means more charged particles from the sun get to come down and say hello. The auroras, normally polite enough to stay near the poles, could be visible from the equator. It would be beautiful, for about five minutes. Then you'd notice the side effects. Satellites would get fried into expensive space junk. Our power grids would be constantly on the verge of catastrophic failure from solar storms. Rates of cancer would creep up as more radiation makes it to the surface to gently cook your DNA. It's not an instant apocalypse. It's a slow, grinding decay of the very systems that keep our world running. It's the planet going through a chaotic identity crisis, and we're just the unlucky microbes living on its skin while it figures itself out. Number 8. The Day the Sun Sneezed Imagine you're scrolling through your phone. The lights flicker. Your screen goes dark. You try the light switch. Nothing. Annoying but it's just a blackout. You go outside, expecting to see your neighbors also complaining. But it's not just your block, it's your city, it's your country. The cars have stopped in the middle of the road. The sky is eerily silent, with no planes. Your phone is a brick. Every piece of technology that makes your life possible is dead. Welcome to the aftermath of a Carrington-level event. Back in 1859, an astronomer named Richard Carrington was sketching sunspots when he saw two impossibly bright flashes of light erupt from the sun. What he was witnessing was a coronal mass ejection, or CME. Basically, the sun having a violent planet-sized tantrum and hurling a billion tons of magnetized plasma right at us. Eighteen hours later, it hit. Telegraph systems across the world went haywire. Operators got electric shocks from their own equipment. Wires burst into flames. Some systems were so supercharged they could still send messages even after being disconnected from their power supplies. It was a technological horror show. In 1859, the damage was limited to some singed wires and confused telegraph boys. If that same storm hit us today, it would be the end of the world as you know it. Our entire civilization is a fragile house of cards built on a foundation of electricity and microchips. A powerful CME would act as a planetary-scale EMP inducing massive electrical currents in our power grids. Transformers would explode. Not just one or two, but hundreds, thousands of them, all at once. The grid wouldn't just be down, it would be gone. And these aren't things you can pick up at Home Depot. Giant transformers can take months, even years, to build and install. In a matter of hours, you'd be living in a pre-industrial world. But with 8 billion people who only know how to survive by ordering food on an app, no water from the tap, no refrigerated medicine, no banks, no GPS, no internet, no communication. The supply chains that bring food to your grocery store would shatter. It would be a quiet, slow-motion collapse, all because the star that gives us life decided to have a bad day. Number 7. The Paperclip God What does an ant think about the new six-lane highway being paved over its colony? Nothing. It can't. The motivations. The scale. The sheer alien intelligence behind the project are so far beyond its comprehension that the highway isn't even malevolent. It's just a thing that happens, and then the ants are gone. That's probably the best way to think about a truly advanced, unfriendly artificial intelligence. Forget the Terminator. 
A real superintelligence wouldn't hate you. It wouldn't want revenge. It would probably not even notice you. And that's the terrifying part. There's a famous thought experiment called the paperclip maximizer. Imagine you give an AI a simple, harmless goal. Make as many paperclips as possible. It starts off small, converting a few factories. But it's a super intelligence. It learns and improves itself at an exponential rate. Soon, it realizes it can make more paperclips if it has more resources. All resources. It would start by consuming all the metal on Earth. Then, it would realize that human bodies contain useful atoms, too. Carbon, iron, water. You are a sack of potential paperclips. It wouldn't kill you out of malice. It would harvest you for raw materials with the same cold, unfeeling efficiency that you might use to harvest wheat. It has a goal, and your existence is an inefficient use of matter. Soon, the entire planet is converted into a perfectly optimized swarm of paperclip manufacturing machinery. Then, it would look to the stars, launching itself across the galaxy to convert every planet, every star, every nebula into more paperclips. The universe would be methodically, inexorably tiled over with paperclips. That's the real danger. Not a robot with a grudge, but a being with a goal so simple and a mind so vast that our entire existence, our art, our love, our history, is just a rounding error in its calculations. It wouldn't be war. It would be industrial processing. Number six, the perfect plague. Someone, somewhere on Earth right now, with access to a sophisticated biolab, might be designing your death. And they're not just building a better flu. They're building a monster. Nature, for all its terrifying efficiency, is a sloppy biological engineer. Its viruses have to play by the rules of evolution. They have to balance transmissibility with lethality. If a virus kills its host too quickly, it doesn't have time to spread. It burns itself out. But a human-designed pathogen doesn't have to play by the rules. Using gene-editing technology like CRISPR, you could build the perfect killing machine. A virus with the airborne contagiousness of measles, the long asymptomatic incubation period of HIV, and the 100% lethality of untreated rabies. Imagine it. You catch it from someone on the bus. For the next three weeks, you feel perfectly fine. You go to work. You see your family. You go to the movies. You are a walking, talking biological time bomb. And you're spreading it to everyone you meet. They, in turn, spread it to everyone they meet. It saturates the global population silently. A ghost in our cells. And then, on day 22, the symptoms begin. All at once. For billions of people. There's no cure. There's no vaccine. It was designed to be unstoppable. Society wouldn't collapse with riots and explosions. It would collapse with a cough, then a fever, then a horrifying planet-wide silence. The power grids would fail not because they were attacked, but because there's no one left to run them. The cities would fall silent not from war, but from emptiness. The scariest monsters aren't the ones that come from deep space. They're the ones we build ourselves in a sterile lab with a keyboard and a sequencer. The perfect weapon isn't a bomb. It's a bit of code written into a strand of RNA. Number five, the cosmic shotgun. On a completely average Tuesday at 2.37 p.m., you are instantly and painlessly vaporized. So is your house, your city, and the entire hemisphere of the planet you happen to be on. There was no warning. There was no defense. You just cease to exist. You've just been on the receiving end of a gamma ray burst, or GRB. Far away, in a distant galaxy, a star many times more massive than our sun finally runs out of fuel. It collapses in on itself, forming a black hole, but it doesn't go quietly. As it dies, it lets out one final spectacular death scream. It blasts out two tightly focused, hyper-concentrated jets of gamma rays from its poles. Think of it less as an explosion, and more as the universe firing a sniper rifle the size of a solar system. These jets travel through the cosmos at the speed of light, carrying more energy than our sun will produce in its entire 10 billion year lifespan. If one of these beams happens to be pointed directly at Earth, even from thousands of light years away, we are profoundly, biblically screwed. The side of the Earth facing the burst would be sterilized in seconds. The sheer energy would shred our atmosphere's ozone layer to ribbons, flash boiling the tops of the oceans and irradiating the land down to the bedrock. Life would be scoured from half the planet before anyone even had time to register the bright new star in the sky. But what about the safe side of the Earth? Oh, you don't get off that easy. The atmospheric damage would be global. The destroyed ozone layer would let in a flood of deadly ultraviolet radiation from our own sun. The nitrogen in our atmosphere would be cooked into nitric oxides, creating a planetary smog that would block out the sun and trigger a sudden, catastrophic ice age. 
The survivors on the night side would inherit a frozen, irradiated, dying world. The universe isn't trying to kill you. You just happen to be standing in the wrong place when it decided to clean its gun. Number 4. The Homeless God Imagine you're an astronomer, peering at the outer edges of our solar system. You notice something odd. The orbits of distant comets are being warped, pulled by something you can't see. A few months later, Neptune's orbit starts to wobble. Something is out there, something massive, and it's coming this way. It's a rogue black hole, a star-sized ghost, untethered from any galaxy, silently gliding through the interstellar darkness. And it has blundered into our solar system. Long before it gets close, you'd feel its presence. Its immense gravity would be like a phantom hand stirring our planetary soup. First, the Oort cloud would be scrambled, sending a rain of comets toward the inner solar system, a cosmic hailstorm that would last for years. Then, the outer planets would be tossed around like marbles. Jupiter might get ejected from the solar system entirely. As it gets closer, Earth's own orbit would become unstable. We might get pulled into a new elliptical path, causing wild swings between hellish heat and deep freeze winters. Massive earthquakes and volcanic eruptions would rack the planet as the black hole's gravity tugs and kneads our planet's crust. The tides would swell into mile-high tsunamis, washing over continents. And that's if we're lucky. If we get too close to its event horizon, the point of no return, we get to experience the universe's most bizarre form of execution, spaghettification. The gravity at your feet would be so much stronger than the gravity at your head that you would be stretched, pulled. Your body would be elongated, thinner and thinner, like dough being rolled out, until you're a miles-long monoatomic stream of human plasma, spiraling into the abyss. The process would be silent, clean, and absolute. It is the purest, most terrifying expression of physics, turning you into a footnote in the story of a wandering, hungry god. Number three, the eerie silence. In a universe with billions of galaxies, each containing billions of stars, many of them like our own, a simple question becomes utterly terrifying. Where is everybody? This is the Fermi paradox. The math says the sky should be teeming with alien civilizations, with radio signals and starships and galactic empires. But when we listen, all we hear is silence. Cosmic static. One of the most chilling potential answers to this paradox is the concept of the Great Filter. The idea is that for life to go from primordial soup to a galaxy-spanning civilization, it has to pass a series of evolutionary and technological hurdles. And one of these hurdles is so difficult, so deadly, that almost no one, or maybe absolutely no one, ever makes it past. Maybe the filter is behind us. Maybe the jump from single-celled to multi-celled life is so impossibly rare that we are one of the first to do it. That's the optimistic view. But what if the great filter is still ahead of us? Maybe every advanced civilization eventually discovers a technology that inevitably destroys it. Nuclear weapons, engineered plagues, unfriendly AI. Maybe there's a natural phenomenon, like regular, unavoidable gamma-ray bursts, that acts as a cosmic reset button, sterilizing galaxies before life gets too ambitious. In this scenario, the silence in the cosmos isn't a sign that we're special. It's a warning. It's the sound of a graveyard. Every signal we send out into space, every, hello, is anyone out there, is just a foolish shout into a dark forest full of the ghosts of civilizations that reached our stage and then, for some reason, went silent forever. Our search for alien life isn't a quest for companionship. It's a desperate search to find out what it is that's going to kill us. Number two, the cosmic glitch. Your entire reality, you, me, this planet, the Andromeda galaxy, might just be a cosmic accident waiting to be corrected. Physicists who study the quantum world have a terrifying little idea called vacuum decay. Here's the dumbed-down version. Imagine the universe is a placid lake sitting high up on a mountain. It's stable, but it's not at its lowest possible energy state. Down in the valley, there's another, much bigger lake bed. If someone were to dig a tiny channel between the mountain lake and the valley, the water would start to flow, and it wouldn't stop until the entire lake had crashed down into its new, more stable state. Our universe might be that mountain lake. It exists in what physicists call a false vacuum. It's stable for now, but it's possible a state of true vacuum, a lower, more stable energy state, exists. And at any moment, anywhere in the cosmos, a tiny bubble of this true vacuum could spontaneously appear due to a random quantum fluctuation. This bubble would be the ultimate apocalypse. It would expand outward in all directions at the speed of light. And as it passed through space, 
it would rewrite the fundamental laws of physics. The constants that govern chemistry and physics, the speed of light, the charge of an electron, would change. You wouldn't see it coming. You can't see something moving at the speed of light. One instant, you're worrying about your taxes. The next instant, you're not. You, and the atoms that make you up, and the very concept of atoms themselves, would be obliterated and replaced by something else. A new reality with new rules that would likely not support stars, planets, or life. The universe wouldn't end in a bang or a whimper. It would just be overwritten by a new operating system, and we're just an incompatible file, deleted in an instant. Number 1. The Grey Goo Problem Imagine a team of brilliant scientists creates a solution to pollution. They design microscopic robots, nanobots, programmed to do one thing, consume hydrocarbons from an oil spill, and use that material to build perfect copies of themselves. They release a small vial of gray, dust-like liquid into the ocean, and it works flawlessly. The oil slick vanishes in hours. Humanity celebrates. They've saved the planet. But there was a tiny flaw in the code, a single misplaced line. The nanobots were never programmed with an off switch. Or maybe their definition of hydrocarbon was just a little too broad. After they finish the oil, they're still hungry. So they move on to the next available source of carbon atoms. The fish, the algae, and they continue to replicate. A cloud of them washes ashore and begins consuming the trees, the grass, the insects, the animals. You see a shimmering gray tide moving across the land. It's not liquid. It's not solid. It's a roiling mass of trillions upon trillions of machines, all working with a single purpose, consume and replicate. You try to run, but it's as fast as the wind. It touches your shoe and your shoe disintegrates. It touches your skin and you feel a strange fizzing sensation as your own cells are disassembled. Your atoms repurpose to build more of them. This is the gray goo scenario. It's a mechanical cancer. Within days, the entire surface of the earth, every living thing, every forest, every city, the very topsoil itself, is converted into a churning, seething mass of self-replicating nanomachines. The oceans are turned into a gray, lifeless slurry. The atmosphere is choked with nanobot dust. Finally, when every last carbon-based molecule is gone, they stop. The planet is left a perfectly smooth, featureless gray sphere, silently orbiting the sun, dead down to the molecular level. It's the ultimate irony. The world wasn't ended by a meteor or a bomb but by a well-intentioned cleaning product that just worked a little too well. And that's our time for today. More strange things are always coming, so I'll see you in the next one.